Good morning or good afternoon, depending on which time zone you're in. I'm Dan Schmidt, editor of Deer and Deer Hunting, and welcome to our free webinar. With me today is publisher Brad Rock. Hi, Dan. Thanks for being here, Brad. Today, Brad and I are going to talk about uh, something that we're all been thinking about. It's getting to be almost June, and we're thinking about deer shoes. We're thinking about bow hunting, and uh, when we think about bow hunting, we often think about the hunt that's coming up, but what we really need to be thinking about is our preparation for the hunt. So today we're going to give you an off-season tactics to-do list. It's a five-point list that Brad and I are going to go over, and uh, we're going to talk about things like food plots, scouting, equipment and shooting skills, tree stands and tree stand placement, and hunting land access. Brad, food plots is your expertise, and uh, why don't you tell us uh, what you're thinking about right now when you're talking about food plots? You know, for food plots, for me, I'm really in an agricultural area, and I have a lot of cash croppers around us. Um, therefore, I'm really monitoring what those guys are planting. If they're planting soybeans around that property in one area, I'm probably also going to try to plant an early season food plot. Um, what I want to do is try to catch those deer as they're going to the uh, bean plot to feed. I want them to stop in my food plots on the way there. So I already know the deer are going to go in that big destination area of the soybean field, and, and I want to try to capture them. Now, if it's corn, I'm going to probably focus on late season food plots, more of the brassicas and, and, and the grapes. I don't have to plant that right now, but I want to get those areas ready. Here in Wisconsin, you got to plant a lot earlier than what those fall blends normally say. You know, for me, for my fall blends, I'm, I'm going to plant that stuff in the middle of August. Uh, for the perennials, I like to have all that stuff in, you know, this time of year right now. By June 1st, I'd like to have it in. Um, the other thing is all my established plants that you have, all your former perennials, which is your clover, your alfalfa. I want to fertilize. I also want to spray any kind of weed control, if it's broad leaves, if it's grasses. I want my food plots in perfect shape by the time September 1st rolls around. Hey, Brad, let me ask you a question there, because we get to ask this a lot. Uh, guys will test the soil, and then they realize that they're probably going to have to add some lime. Can you add that lime before you plant or when you plant? Yeah, it's actually best if you do it before you plant, because... Uh, you can work it right into the soil. Lime has to have contact with the soil to become effective to turn it neutral. And that's what you want is a neutral soil. Um, if you work that into your soil, it'll work faster than if you spread it out on top. Now, I'm not saying you can't spread it out on top. It'll just become more effective. Um, so that there's what you go. You can use multiple types of lime as well to skin it up. If you're working it into your soil, you probably want to use an egg lime. Um, if you want something to react a little bit quicker, you can use pelletize. Pelletize is more expensive. Now, what about when you're talking about spraying for weeds? Now, a lot of times you might be working on a pot that's already been worked before, but what about the guy who's got maybe a piece of fallow land that hasn't been planted? Uh, how important, I mean, can he just rip that soil up and plant it, or does he really need to spray that? You really should kill it. Um, you should kill all the weeds. Uh, two things. One is, um, by doing that, the soil will start breaking down a little bit as well, so it will be easier to work up. No matter what you do, when you do work up that soil, from, from it sitting there and fallow and all those weeds have seeded out over years, year after year after year, you're going to have a weed problem for the first couple of years probably, but it's nothing you can't control. You know, what I do in that situation is I spray the weeds, but let them all die until they're perfectly brown, you know, cut them down to nothing, till it under, and then wait for another two weeks, and they'll start greening up again, and then I spray the weeds so that they're dead. By that time, I'll have the soil in good shape. I've already worked in my lawn. Uh, I'll also have uh, fertilized that soil, and I'll have compacted it. So, therefore, once I kill the weeds again, you can actually go in that very day and plant it. So, I plant it, and then when the rain hits, you, you should be in good shape. Here's a question we get to a lot is a uh, guy has a small uh, acreage to plant food plots. Uh, does it, is it worth his time to plant corn? Corn, it is, it, it's hard. You need a bigger plot, and I've already tried it with this. You know, plots that are as big as an acre, acre and a half. And, and for the guys that don't know, an acre is a pretty big plot. It, it's the size of a football field, basically. And, and even in that type of uh, area, if the deer do not have a lot of other food sources, they're going to decimate the corn, they're going to eat it, they're going to pull off the tops, and therefore you're going to end up with nothing. What would you recommend if I only could plant one type of forage? What, what would you plant? Uh, you know, there's, it, it's tough. You know, I want to know if you're an early season hunter or a late season hunter. I mean, if you're early season, you like going out there early season, it's, it's any of the perennials, the clovers, the chicories, alfalfa, because that's what the deer are really keen on that time of year. 
Now, if you want to hunt the rut, Brassica. Brassica is where it's at. It's the race. It's the purple top tournaments. So the deer just thrive in that stuff once the weather turns cold. Um, so, I mean, it's one of those two things. It depends on what your hunting technique is. So we got a question that came in here. Um, it says, I hunt 15 acres adjacent to a several hundred acre sanctuary. How small is too small for a full plot? And how about creating a pond in addition to small full plot? You, you know, water sources are key, uh, around, and it depends on your area. Again, you could have a spot where you're, where you don't have a lot of water, and therefore if you dug a little pond, it's going to be an attraction. I'm in an area that has a lot of creeks and uh, a lot of ponds and other water sources, so water's not as crucial in my area. Now, the size of that food plot depends what's in that sanctuary. I mean, if there's any kind of other egg fields in there, those deer are going to key in on that. But um, how small is too small? I got I got plots. And I live in an area that has a lot of deer that are as small as a quarter of an acre. And what do I normally plant in that? You know, some kind of perennial, like a, a like the clovers, because you know it's renewing. I mean, the deer keep coming to it. Brassicas are good. You know, they'll leave it alone, but they're going to wipe out that quarter of an acre in less than a week. So unless you're there hunting it, you might miss your whole food plot. Is there uh, is it, so if you have a small plot, is there a a window of time? Can you plant? too early. Yeah, definitely. So and you got to make sure the soil is warm enough. Um, the soil is going to be at about 50 degrees to be able to plant for the season to germinate or they'll rot in the soil. Um, I saw we have another question about when you want to plant oats. You know, oats you can plant either time of year. Really, you can plant them in the spring. You probably don't want them to mature because what the deer like is they like that first, you know, first growth up to like five or six inches. As soon as they start getting stemmy, that's when the deer don't want to eat them anymore. Um, I like oats in the fall, and I like to mix it with Nebraska, strip oats, strip Nebraska. I know I like that. It, it just diversifies a little bit, and it takes some of the pressure off the Nebraska. I know the deer are not supposed to eat rakes and turnips until they freeze. Once the deer get used to it, they're going to start eating it, and if they eat the leaves off too early, you just don't have the fun. Therefore, if you give them the oats, they'll pound the oats and leave everything else alone. That's some good advice, Brad. We're going we're gonna to take questions as we go through the webinar here, but we're going to get on to our next topic, and that's scouting. Uh, when we talk about off-season, we're talking about scouting. And when we think about scouting, a lot of times we think about um, getting actually out there, you know, hiking, putting some boot leather to the ground. But scouting, a lot of times, if you're really targeting specific deer and you really know the property you're hunting, we're talking about glassing from a distance. And in today's age, we're talking about the use of trail cameras. I'm going to let Brad talk about the cameras because uh, Brad has had a lot of experience using the different products that are out there and the different technologies. So I think, uh, what I'd like to say on that is if you have a property, uh, a lot of times when we're thinking about bow hunting, uh, the days of just getting a property and going out there on opening day and seeing what's going to walk past you, that's pretty much over because we have the technology with cameras and we have the ability now to uh, – to view these deer all year round. And when I talk about glassing, we're talking about from a distance, and why do you do that? Is it neat to do it? Yeah, it's neat to do it, but what it does is it teaches you about the deer and how they use your land. What do you think about that, Brad? I mean, we're talking about the keywords that deer are. What are some pointers uh, that you can give for uh, observing from a distance? You know, I, I'm really, when I'm glassing, it can be from your house, it can be driving around in, in early mornings or late in the evening. I'm look, looking for specific deer that I probably know were on my property last year. Because these bachelor groups sometimes will, will move away up to three miles. But say if I recognize a deer, and, uh, you know, we name our deer, and I know it sounds crazy, but a lot of hunters do. I, just pretend I saw the sticker box, you know, and he's got a couple stickers off his main beam. And I recognize that deer and from last year hunting and from trail cameras and even from observation on the tree stands. I know where that deer hangs out. I'm going to hang for that deer. Then. I'm, uh, I'm going to say, hey, he's still around. He's going to come back into his core area. This is where he's going to be come September, come October, and that's where I'm going to get ready. And that's why I like the glass. I mean, glass, it's fun in that you see a lot of deer, and you'll see big bachelor groups. Some of those deer are never going to be on your property. You could try to get permission to hunt in that area or, or not. Um, I really enjoy scouting with game cameras. Um, and I do some different things with the game cameras. So hang on, we got a question. Uh, the question here we have is, how close can you expect to get to a mature, mature buck with a vehicle, observing him before you start to affect his travel pattern? I'll, I'll take the first part of this question, Brad, because it's a good question. Uh, some of the things that we've uh, printed in the magazine through scientific research is 
you really cannot run a mature buck out of his core area. But one thing Brad pointed out, in the summertime, you'll see a uh, bachelor group of bucks, and, yeah, um, those deer are going to be hard to hunt. You can get them early season. When you talk about early season, here in the upper Midwest, we have both seasons that come in in September. Um, in some areas, they come in even earlier than that. Now, if you can target a deer that early, I, I won't worry about spooking him so much as I would... I would worry about trying to pinpoint him through observations and get a drop on him before those patches would start breaking up, which usually is right around, the, you know, as you start getting into archery season. Exactly. You know, uh, from my experience, the deer in the summer are kind of carefree. I mean, you can stop on the road and sit there and watch them, and they'll just sit there eating the beans or whatever they're eating and look at you. And, and granted, it depends on the area. If there's a lot of people in the charts going around and that, that are doing the same thing as you, you're not going to see those deer until after night. You know, here in Wisconsin, we do have long shirt shining, and that's another method of scouting. I mean, you can go in at night, shine, you know, even late, 2, 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning, a lot of times it's those big deer are right on the edge. And, and, again, I'm just looking to see what deer made it through the season. Now, as, as it comes closer to our bow season, say late August, now I'm looking for deer that I can hunt, because if they're still late August in that same area, it's probably a deer that you can harvest early in the bow season, that September 15th bow season that we have. Uh, some good points there, too, Brad. And, and one thing I think we should bring up is um, can you spook a deer through uh, observing him through vehicles? Yeah, you can spook him. Are you going to run him out of his core area? No. Uh, one thing we know through research is that you can alter a deer's home range by repeated visits into his core area, and that's where cameras come involved. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and when I'm talking about cameras, I'm not getting into the bedding area. I use a couple of different types of cameras. One is wildlife eye. And, and what do I do with wildlife eye? For the, those of you that are not familiar with it, it's a video camera. Um, I, I don't use the sensor as far as the top sound and takes video when the deer is there. I, I time it specifically to go on during a time in the afternoon when I think the deer are coming into the food spot. And what am I doing with that? I'm actually trying to look at when and where the deer is coming into that food spot. And first off, if I don't have any mature deer, I'm moving on to the next food spot. And if I don't have any mature deer there, I keep moving it until I find them. But once I find them, then I'm looking at where they're entering that food spot. And now I'm trying to look at my aerial map saying, ah, oh, here's where he's coming in. He's probably better than this area. And, you know, that's how I plan my hunting strategy. The next camera, once I know where he's coming in that, that spot, I'll go in there with three different trail cameras and hit the main trails that are coming in from that area. And, again, I'm just trying to fine-tune where exactly where those deer are bedded. So normally they're not that far from the food plot. How, far, how often do you check your cameras, Brad, and what kind of uh, procedure do you take when you go out to check your cameras? You know, I, I treat it like I'm hunting. I, I wear my sensory clothes and that, that I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to leave any human scent um, in, the, in the areas that, that don't mature deer are visiting, because again, you can alter that pattern, you probably won't bust them out of there, but I want to make sure that they're pretty much undisturbed. The other thing that you can do with, you know, for cameras, great spot, spots are mineral licks and the water sources, and believe it or not, I use mock scrapes. Um, the deer will scrape that time of year, even when they're in velvet, I've got great photos of deer in scrapes, you know, working the lick in branches as they're in velvet, and really all I'm doing is trying to get them to go to a certain spot to really see the number of deer that I have there and the number of bucks that I have there in the tail of my bucks. Again, I, I'm just trying to find out what's on my land. That's a good point because you talk about using mock scrapes and people often think that's reserved for the rut, but um, mock scrape is a good-looking branch. All of the deer are going to use it, those farms and bucks, and they're going to use that throughout the season. So what you might actually create for yourself there is some pretty good uh, tree stand hunting opportunities. Yeah. The one thing I want to uh, warn people on is, as hunters, don't get discouraged if all you have on your property is dough. Um, last year, I mean, Dan probably knows this, but I was coming in uh, for one of my food plots, and I had over 1,400 photos, and it had nothing but dough. I think I had two little bucks, two little years, half old bucks. And when it hit October, it was like somebody flipped the switch, so it started to get all the three-year-olds were coming there. And I knew they were going to be there, you know, because they always come there, but... Normally they're there a little bit early, but I, I stayed positive and I knew they'd give us air and they ended up doing just that. Okay, let's keep moving on. Now we're going to move on to our, our third point here, and it's about, uh, we're talking about equipment. And this is your, the pre-season really needs to be focused on getting your equipment together, 
getting your equipment tuned and shooting with the confidence that you know you're going to need when it comes hunting season. Um, when we talk about tuning your bow, uh, an easy thing, now if you're not a tech guy, and Brad is, I'm not, I'll take my bow to our local pro shop guy. He will paper tune it for me. How important is it to have your bow paper tuned? Uh, it, it's crucial because if, if you're shooting any kind of broadhead, even expandable, to some point will flame a little bit. But if you're shooting a fixed blade head and your bow's not tuned, they're definitely going to hit the different spots than your field tips are. Um, personally, I'm not, I don't even practice anymore field tips. I'm a broadhead shooter. In, uh, when, I, uh, when I tune my bow, it, it jams right. I'm a tech head and I really get into it and make sure the peep's perfect and everything's perfect. But, you know, I, I'll sight in with field tips a little bit, but then I'll switch to broadheads. And once I'm confident, once I have my pins all um, placed, you know, I'll have the 20, 30, 40, 50. I normally do not shoot in any range inside of 40 yards. I'm shooting 50, 60, 70 yards. Not that I ever kill a deer that far. I mean, I have no intentions of Never would kill a deer in the land or if it was 50 yards away and I had a good shot, I would not shoot. But if by doing that, it makes your form so much better that, you know, by the time the season starts, it is 30 yards away. I mean, I want to be able to hit a quarter. And you can. I mean, it, it, that quarter looks like it's the size of a pink of play. That's pretty hard. It shoot those yeah, really does a lot for your confidence. And that's something I've learned from Brad is I'll practice 45, 50 yards in summer and I've never taken a shot even close to being that far. But uh, as Brad says, it will, when you shoot farther distances, it magnifies flaws in the shooting form and you can correct those. Now, when, you, when you're shooting 45, 50 yards or even more, um, and you're shooting good groups, when you come in at 20, that's like a slam dunk. Absolutely. And, you know, Dan, you know confidence is a big part of bow hunting. And if you know where that arrow's going to hit, you pick that spot. And when you pull that release trigger, it hits that spot. And that, that's all it is about right there. That's the biggest thing. And shooting broadheads, I agree with Brad. I shoot nothing but broadheads when I get into this time of year. I will shoot field points just to get myself on target. But then when I'm shooting broadheads, I'm not really even worried about shooting groups when I know my bow is sighted in, it's tuned, and it's shooting straight. Um, I will actually shoot at, we have block targets, we'll shoot at those circles and take a different shot every time. The other thing that I often stress is I shoot almost all my gear sitting down. I'll be sitting in my tree stand when I shoot. I'm probably 95% or more. And if you're a guy like that, or even if you shoot 50-50, some sitting down, some standing up, the different trajectory on that arrow that you need to practice now before you get to the season and shooting from an elevated distance. I totally agree, and I like one other part that you hit there, Dan. You always see people practicing from their yard, you know, which is great, but they're on level ground. How many of them are shooting in a tree stand? I know you got a tree stand. I have a tree stand home that we specifically use for practicing. But, again, you want to practice the same way that you're actually going to be hunting. If you're hunting out of a tree stand, let's shoot out of a tree stand. If you're sitting, shoot sitting. I mean, if you do both, shoot both ways. Um, you know, it, it's just a big part of bow hunting. He deserves to do it or, you know, all the deer. That we work that hard, hard to get in front of these deer, especially when you're talking about deer are three, four, five years old. Uh, you, you owe it that much to the animal to be sure that you're shooting right and you're not just taking flyers at deer. So let's go on to our next topic. This is number four, and we're talking about uh, stands. We're talking about tree stands, and uh, one tip that I will always say is have at least three stands ready for opening day of bow season. And why do I say that? Um, obviously, because of the wind direction. Wind directions are usually predictable, but sometimes you'll get a, a weird day in there that you're just not going to be able to hunt a stand. And I will not hunt a stand unless the wind is perfect. So when I say have at least three stands hung, um, I'll go a step further and say three stands in addition to uh, field edge stands and food pot stands. Some, uh, yeah, you might see a lot of deer on the edge of those food pots and fields when you're hunting early season, but a lot of times, especially if you have a uh, acorn drop, uh, you need in-wood stands. So we're talking about inside corners and things like that. We had just had a question come in here. Yeah, right? and the question is, how many stands uh, or how many weeks do you hang the tree stands before opening day in your area? I have mine hung by, usually by, well, within two weeks I'll have my stands hung. So we're talking about the second week of June. I, I'm kind of a freak that way, too. You know, our, our deer, and I've hunted the same spot on my own property for 30 years. So I kind of know the pattern of the deer. My early season stuff is already in, but as I'm scouting, 
if, if I know, you know, if I'm watching a big group of deer, a bachelor group, and it's August 15th, and, and all of a sudden it's September 1st and they move, I'm moving with them. I'm hanging a tree stand. I'm, I'm going to find where they're going, and I'm going to hang that tree stand. The big thing is scent free. I mean, don't go in there after you've been working outside on your lawn and all sweaty again. You know, you want to go in there as scent free as possible, spray down your tree stand. When you're hanging these things, man, I, I know you pull all yours in and put them in the garage. You know, that's a great time to do the maintenance on them. Check the straps. Um, and straps don't deteriorate like they used to, but, but you'll definitely get some dust and some stuff, and a lot of times they'll start to squeak. So powder silicone is what I use, and I, I make sure it's totally squeak-free. I mean, I want those streets to get perfect, too. Yeah, uh, that's, that's one thing that I do is I will actually uh, maintain those things in winter so when it's time to hang them again, you're ready to go. But um, another point that I'll make is I've hunted a lot of public land in my life, time and uh, what I'll do is this time of year obviously in Wisconsin we can't leave a stand in the woods overnight so this time of year if I'm hunting a spot I will pick out my area and I'll pair it so I can get in there with a climber or whatever and get that if I'm hunting that first week of bow season I know exactly the tree I'm going to you're taking a little bit of gamble on public land because you know you're sharing it with other people but you're going in there with you know what you need to do. It's not like you're getting in there and saying, well, I can't shoot behind me, I can't shoot to the side. It's all ready for you to go. So uh, have those things prepped early. I mean, if you, if you can wait, I mean, if you can't get them until the 1st of July, well, you still have about two months to do it. The other thing that I often do is I'll hang them in the middle of the day, in the summertime, and if you can, this is a tip that John Eberhardt taught me. He writes for us a lot. Um, you time it by the weather. If you know there's a rainstorm coming in on Wednesday, I'll get out there Tuesday, and I'll hang that stand, get out of there, that storm comes through, and it basically washes away that you've ever been there. Yeah, that's a great tip. I, I try to do that myself. Um, one last thing on tree stand, you know, you, you hang the tree stand, really think about how you're going to enter and exit that area and how you're going to get to that tree stand because, you know, the deer will try to pattern you as well. So you want to go in, you know, as low-key as you possibly can so they don't see you. It doesn't blow your wind into the bedding area. There's lots of, you know, lots of things to consider when you place a tree stand. Obviously, the most important tip, and we shouldn't have saved that for last, is entrance and exit are the number one key uh, next to wind direction. Um, the other thing that you need to, when my success ratio rocketed, skyrocketed, is when I basically went in there with a the mission. I'm getting a stand hung, and I'm getting out of there, and I'm leaving it alone. Don't mess around, you know. If you want to hang uh, trail cameras, do not put them near your stand. Yeah. Uh, get it in a travel corridor that's maybe several hundred yards away at minimum, and uh, leave that area alone, especially if you know that's a good spot. You just want to leave it alone. The element of surprise is there. You really uh, ratchet up your chances for success. Do not trim too much. There's another good point. Do not trim too much. Another, What I'll do often is I will just either bend a, a branch around or tie it back with some fishing line or something like that. Well, when you cut a, when you cut something off, you're in a buck's bedroom. He's gonna he's gonna recognize it, and they might avoid that area and skirt it. Let's get on to our uh, our fifth and final topic here for our preseason uh, preparation. We're talking about hunting land access. This actually should be number one. Uh, we often get caught up in shooting and getting excited and all this stuff. But hey, if you don't own the land, you better have that knocked away first. Public or private. Know where you're going to be hunting. If it's free by permission, they have that hammered out now. Call the landowner, even if you've hunted there. I've had this happen to me many, many times, and I've learned about it. If you, if you don't keep in constant contact with that landowner, one thing that Steve Bartilla is another good writer for us. He, uh, another good tip that he gave me, he said, unless you own it, you'll always be looking for another place to hunt. And that is the truth. Um, if you're leasing land, have it in writing. If it's not in writing, it's not a lease. It's a glorified rental agreement if you don't have it in writing. So have those, have your permission secured, however you're doing it. And Brad, uh, you know, what, what do you think might be another good tip in that? You know, for, for me, you know, I, hunt, I hunt on my own private land, so I have the permission. But I also hunt out of state a lot. Um, when you do that, not only do you have to make sure you have a home that you're going to hunt on, don't forget about the tags. I mean, this is the time if, I mean, Iowa, you have to have it in by the end of May. Kansas, you have to have it by the end of May. Illinois, July, you got to, you know, June, June 1st of July. So you got to make sure if you are traveling out of state, you need to know when the tag application dates are and make sure you apply on time. 
I forgot last year. Where's Iowa? I missed Iowa. I, I would have drew a tag last year in Iowa. I missed the year I in Iowa. That hurts deeply. So make sure you know what you're going to do. Good point. So um, that being said, if anybody has any questions, we're going to hang around here for a few minutes. Uh, I'd like to chime in with any questions you have. I'd like to, to again remind you this is a free webinar that we've been putting on. This is a one in a series that we're going to be producing this year, and it's going to be on everything from deer hunting tactics to deer behavior. We've got some exciting guests lined up. Charlie Alzheimer's going to be with us again, Matt Harper. we got we got just a, a real great lineup for everybody. All right, we don't have any other questions coming. I'd like to thank everybody. And, uh, and I'd like to thank Brad for showing up today, Brad. It's, again, it's, it's great working with you, and you always have some great insights. Yeah, great time. Well, I hope everybody does it well. Oh. Uh, okay, final question here, Brad. What are hunters most likely to regret not doing in the off season when the season starts? You, you know, for me, it is too fun. Um, just because I'm in an area that, that has a lot of deer, and a lot of my neighbors are also playing too fun. So if I don't have time, you know, land so that's the way I want it to. My deer are going to migrate. I mean, the core area, most people in Wisconsin have a relatively small amount of land. That deer's probably traveling over several different properties. And, uh, you know, if their properties are better than mine, with food and water and all the other sources that a white tail wants, they're not going to be in mine. They're going to be living on theirs. Now, food is where it's at. That's obviously number one. If you don't have the food, your chances of uh, seeing deer in general are going to be reduced, but your chances of seeing that buck in a lifetime are going to be reduced even greater. I would say uh, my answer to this question, just to be a little bit different, you're going to regret it if you don't practice enough with your bow. Um, it's happened to us. It's happened to me, and it'll happen to it'll happen to me again. The second you neglect your shooting practice, is the time when you have that buck within range and you don't get the shot or you miss the shot. Now, the final thing is, is to purchase these webinars, to view them, make sure to go to the website deerandeerhunting.com. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Again, Brad, thanks a lot. Good luck, everyone.